Well, we're reading from the scriptures, uh, first of all from Luke chapter 2, Luke chapter 2 and verse 8, page 1033, Luke chapter 2 verse 8, page 1033. 1033 and we read through to verse 35 and in the same region there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night and an angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were filled with fear And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Saviour, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the multitude, sorry, with the angel, a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those whom he, uh, with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it marveled at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, as it had been told them. And at the end of eight days, when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the time came for their purification, According to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord. Every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord, and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and Uh, devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace, according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And his father and his mother marveled at what was said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign that is opposed, and the sword will pierce through your own soul also, so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. And then we turn to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 1, page 
1180. Philippians 2 and verse 1. We read through to verse 11. <coughs> so if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. I want to turn now to 1 Timothy chapter 3. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3. I want to read a short, short section from verse uh, 14 uh, to verse uh, 16. First Timothy chapter 3 and verse 14. Uh, page 1194 in the Church Bible. <clears throat> I hope to come to you soon, but I am writing these things to you, so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by the angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. Amen. In the 1980s and perhaps before, but that's when I remember it, uh, there was such a thing as a hall of mirrors that was part of um, fun fairs or amusement arcades. Some of you perhaps went around them. And you walked into this room and you began to look at yourself in a series of mirrors. And because of the way in which the mirrors were made, one made you look short and fat, another made you look thin and tall, and a, a third would have given you a completely distorted face, and so on. The hall of mirrors, I'm not sure they're still around, but they were a great laugh. None of the mirrors reflected accurately your appearance, but it didn't matter. It was only a bit of fun, a day out or an evening out at the amusements. The incarnation which we've been looking at over the past weeks and throughout the month of December, in the incarnation in the modern world is in many respects like a hall of mirrors. It's distorted, widely, badly, 
distorted. If we look at it through the mirror of society or indeed through the mirror of much of the Christian church today. And so we've been looking at this theme, Christmas Revisited. We began with scripture and then we went secondly in our next study uh, to the church apostolic and then the western church uh, as it developed up until the 1500s and finally the reformed church uh, of Geneva and of Scotland from which we descend. And then last week uh, we thought about um, the uh, Christmas or the incarnation uh, in uh, our own families and our own personal lives. How do we relate to this event that seems to dominate society uh, more and more? And we have seen, uh, as we've looked at these things, many distortions of the incarnation. Today we want to conclude our series by looking at these verses or looking at a, a phrase um, uh, would be more accurate from 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh. Up to this point in this letter, First uh, Timothy, Paul is writing to a young pastor and the congregation which he pastors at Ephesus in Asia Minor. Though the church has not been particularly long in existence, there are already some very clear challenges in the life of the church. There are disputes about genealogies and other things from the Old Testament there are those who have a wrong understanding of the law of the Old Testament. And Timothy, almost against his will, is left to deal with these things. And part of that, dealing with that, is preaching sound doctrine, but also it's appointing godly leaders uh, to the eldership uh, and to the diaconate. And then it seems that there's some need as well to clarify and confirm the roles of men and women in the church, that men are to be in leadership and women uh, are, while well, they have a, a vital and important role, it is that of um, submission to male uh, leadership. And it's as if Paul says, well, actually, there's so much more I want to say about this, but I actually would really like to come and visit you. I would rather speak to you face to face than write this, uh, these further things in the letter. And so he brings in then uh, this statement that we've just read. Um, I want to be with you, but you know, uh, I'm old enough as a Christian and as a, a, an apostle now that, to know that the plans of man are not always the plans of God. Things get delayed. Things don't come to pass. And therefore... He almost sums things up. The first three chapters he sums up in these words that we have here, verses 14 to 16. Timothy, you and as an elder, your fellow elders, the members of the congregation, you need above all else to know how are we to behave? How are we to act in the church of God? Uh, and then he makes this statement, uh, and it's the statement we want to look at this morning, the first phrase of it. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh. I should say in passing that the word God is not used there, but it is a pronoun which clearly refers to God. It's God was manifested in the flesh. And so um, there are three things that we want to note this morning as we think about the incarnation marvelous in our eyes. The incarnation is marvelous 
in our eyes. As we see it in Scripture, as we engage with it in Scripture, as we embrace it from Scripture, the incarnation is marvelous in our eyes. And as we look at this um, text uh, this morning, this phrase, this opening statement from verse 16, there are three things we want to note. First of all, we want to note the incarnation, a miracle. The incarnation is a miracle. Scripture teaches us that God is spirit. God does not have a body. He doesn't have bodily parts. And yet at times, Scripture attributes bodily parts to God. For example, you'll read about the arm of God. You'll read about the eyes of God, the hand of God. And of course, these are not teaching us that God possesses limbs like us. Rather, by using these terms that we understand, we're being taught about the character of God, the arm of God. God is strong. The eyes of God, God is all-seeing. The hand of God, God is continually at work in the world that he has made. But when we come to our text, it states clearly, categorically, and undeniably that God took human flesh. So what do we have here? Is this a contradiction? As some people would say, Scripture is full of. Saying one time God does not have a body. Saying at another time uh, God uh, becomes or was manifested in the flesh. Well, no, it's not a contradiction. We're now uh, being uh, directed to another reality that Scripture teaches. Namely, that the Son of God, equal and eternal with the Father, became what he was not, a human being, whilst continuing to be what he eternally was, the Son of God. That's really important that we hold those two aspects of the being of Christ Jesus together. He is fully and eternally God, but he's also truly and fully human. God was manifested in the flesh. Jesus did not set aside his deity or his Godhead. He didn't cease to be God in becoming man. No, he became what he was not whilst continuing to be what he eternally was. The Creator became a creature. The Lord of glory came to earth. And he did so by the womb of a virgin. And so we have these two doctrines set by side by side. The eternal God has no body or bodily parts. But then at a point in time, the Son of God took human flesh and bone. And he did so, Scripture teaches us, by the womb of a virgin. Mary was not married. She was a virgin. She had not uh, been involved in a sexual relationship with any man. Yes, she was engaged to Joseph. But Joseph was as godly a man as she was um, a godly woman. Joseph did not father a child outside of marriage. He did not become one flesh with Mary until after the birth of Jesus. Jesus, Scripture tells us, was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's a miracle. That's a miracle. Conception takes place when a man and a woman come together and uh, everything biologically is at the right point uh, in time. But here we realize and we're being taught that the Son of God becomes a man without the involvement of a man. It's by the work and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and so um, it is a miracle. 
He is the God-man. Or as I was thinking the other day when I was working this sermon, he is the Christ-man. And maybe we should be changing Christmas to uh, Christ-man because that's what it's all about. That's what it's truly about. Christ becoming man. J.I. Packer has written, he was a theologian, is a theologian with the um, um, Anglican Church, uh, moved to Canada, and he's written these words, The incarnation is where the profoundest and most unfathomable depths of the Christian revelation lie. The profoundest. And the most unfathomable depths of the Christian revelation lie. You and I could think about this, and we will think about it for all eternity, and we'll never get to the bottom of it. It's such a glorious, um, wonderful uh, event beyond human comprehension. And um, C.S. Lewis, he wrote, the central miracle asserted by Christians is the incarnation. Do you get it? The central miracle, the foremost miracle, you could say the first miracle was not the turning of the water into wine, but it was indeed the incarnation. Every other miracle, uh, Lewis continues, prepares for this. So you see miracles in the Old Testament. Um, and or exhibits this, or results from this. All discussion of them in isolation from it is futile. In other words, if the Christ who came is not God in human flesh, then um, all the other things that he came to do or claimed to do, and all discussion of other miracles is futile and pointless. You see, this is a once uh, in um, human history event. It's greater than the turning of water into wine. It's greater than the feeding of the 5,000. It's greater than raising a person from the dead. Uh, because there were many such occasions when Jesus did those things. But there's only one occasion, only one occasion when God was manifested in the flesh, when God became incarnate, incarnate. It is the miracle of all miracles. And brethren, this is how we should think about the incarnation. We need to get it lifted up from the, the, the gutters, as it were, of society today. And we need to get the, the incarnation of Christ right up there. Uh, something that we look up to and we, we marvel at and wonder at. In the same way as we look up at a starry sky and a frosty night and we just say, wow, wow. And it is the church's task. It's our task to retain the incarnation in this form, that it is a miracle. Uh, and it is our task to proclaim the incarnation as a miracle. And I simply ask, is that really what we see happening around us these days, that the incarnation is being a miracle? Uh, and present it as a miracle. The miracle of all miracles. But brethren, for us it should be. And let's take time over the holidays to let this sink into our minds that the incarnation is a miracle. God was manifested in flesh. It shouldn't have happened. It didn't need to happen. And it couldn't have happened if God had not done it by his almighty power. And he did it in his son. That's the first thing. The second thing we want to see this morning is the incarnation is a mystery. It's a mystery. And a mystery to you and me is something that cannot be explained or solved. 
you lose something you had earlier and you say to your spouse, it's a mystery where it is gone. I had it five minutes ago. I left it on the shelf. It isn't there. Are you sure you didn't move it? The older I get, the more of those mysteries I seem to have. Uh, and there seem to be. Can't find the, the car keys, that important letter, uh, the wallet. It's a mystery. It's beyond explanation. I see a few smiles. People get obviously in the same wavelength as me or the same age as me. But here Paul uses the word mystery in a different sense. He's using it in a different sense. He's meaning something very different from what we mean by mystery. In Scripture, a mystery is something hidden until God reveals it. Something hidden until God reveals it. And it can't be found out or discovered by human research or uh, by human minds. It's uh, not an accidental discovery like the £10 note lying on the street as you go to the shops. Um, sometimes the best um, parallel I can think of is sometimes a family will go on a trip and the children will say, Mommy, Daddy, where are we going? Where are we going? And parents say, it's a mystery. It's a mystery. The parents know. And the parents are taking them there. And it's going to be revealed to them by their parents. But the children don't know. It's hidden from the children until the parents reveal it. That's mystery in Scripture. It's hidden from us until God reveals it to us. Salvation is a mystery, isn't it? Ultimately. It's hidden from every human being until God the Holy Spirit actually reveals salvation in Christ to us. Opens our darkened eyes and uh, our closed minds, and our hard hearts. Um, but we'll leave that uh, at this stage. So, the incarnation, a mystery. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, before God created the world, Father, Son, and Spirit agreed the Son would come to earth in human form. The Son would become incarnate. And his incarnation would be the mystery of godliness. That's what Paul's saying here. The incarnation is the mystery of godliness. That means, in our definition, the incarnation is the revelation of godliness to this world. And that is phenomenal when we begin to think of that, isn't it? That just blows our minds. That God would give us a human being or he would put his son in human form to reveal here's what a godly life looks like. He would live a human life of complete, continuing godliness. His thoughts, his words, his attitudes, his ambitions, his actions, his aspirations, as we were singing there in, in Psalm 40, it was what? All God-centered. I've come to do your will. It's my delight. I proclaim you um, in the congregation of the people. And you see, what we need to remember is that such a human life had not been seen on the earth since when? Since the earliest days of Adam and Eve. Before they sinned. Before they sinned. They were the mystery of godliness. They were the revelation of godliness. As they managed that creation. As they en engaged with the, the animals. And, and cared for them. And named them. And everything else. They were the mystery of godliness. The revelation of godliness. But we know how tragically that was lost. And so the incarnation, Paul says, and the incarnation in our eyes is to be nothing other than godliness revealed. The revelation of godliness in Christ. 
And that means godliness, pleasing God, becoming like God, being acceptable to God, um, is bound up in Christ. It's bound up in his person. It's bound up in his work, in, a human, in his human body. It means also that godliness is attainable by you and me only where? Only in the incarnate Christ. Only in the revelation of godliness that is found in him. You see, Scripture teaches us throughout, uh, and we know in our own hearts, that God is offended by human sin. My sin, your sin, our sin, the sin of all persons is an offense to the thrice holy God. But here we're being taught, as Scripture and as the Gospels make increasingly clear, or the New Testament makes increasingly clear, godliness is achieved for us in the Christ man. The Christ man. Who not only lived a life without sin, but who then died the sin-bearing death on the cross taking the wrath of God upon himself and taking it off us and emptying that cup uh, to its dregs. And so, brethren, you and I, when we think of the incarnation, we're to think of, yes, the miracle, but we're to think also of the mystery of godliness. And if we are truly focused on the birth of Christ, then what will it reveal? It will reveal the pursuit of godliness. And yet, brethren, we've got to say, sadly, is that what is happening in our society? Is it the pursuit of godliness? It's the very opposite, is it not? In many places and many cases. And we do we hear this being presented in the uh, observance of uh, the birth of Christ? Do we hear this being presented as being the essence of the incarnation? It's all about godliness. It's all about that we could become godly. It's all about that we could be made godly. It's all about that we would live godly lives here and now. And that's the challenge to us from this point this morning, is that um, if we are in earnest about um, the incarnation, we will be in earnest about godliness in our lives. We'll be in earnest about Christ, that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and that we have come to the Father through him but also we'll want others to know that they can only come to the Father through him. So the incarnation is a miracle. The incarnation, it's a mystery. But then thirdly, the incarnation, it's a marvel. It's a marvel. We all maybe don't use this word very often, but we know what it means. Um... Uh, to marvel. One of our children used to corrupt it and they used to say, Mum, you're a marvel. They really meant, Mum, you're a marvel. But, uh, Mum, you're a marvel. Uh, so, to marvel, what does it mean? Well, it's to be filled with surprise. It's to be filled with wonder and astonishment and appreciation for someone or something that has happened. A marvel is a wonderful, astonishing thing or event that calls forth your, your praise and your expressed appreciation. We say, for example, at times it's a marvel that she has recovered from her accident. She was in death's door. Or we say it's a marvel he did so well in his exams uh, because he was sick for most of the year. Not because he didn't work. Well, that could also be true. But it's a marvel. And the incarnation is a marvel. 
Paul uses the words without controversy. And without controversy, great is the mystery of the incarnation. There's no disputing the matter. And this aspect of the, the, um, the, the incarnation being a marvel, uh, whilst Paul doesn't tease it out here, it's teased out in the Gospels for us. That's why we read from Luke chapter 2. Because Luke is very, very fond of this word marvel in the Greek language. And he uses it in connection with the birth of John. Luke chapter 1, verse 21 and verse 63. This child that was born to uh, Zechariah and Elizabeth when they were old. It's a marvel. But then he uses it twice in connection with the birth of Jesus. And we read it there in Luke chapter 2 and verse 18. And Luke chapter 2 and verse 33. I think in verse 18 in the ESV it's translated as wondered, but it's marveled. It's the same word. And then if we went on in Luke's gospel, we would discover that the people marveled at the ministry of Jesus. Luke 4 verse 22. And the disciples themselves marveled at, some, uh, at, at what they were seeing in his life and actions. Luke 8 25. And the last time Luke lose it, is in Luke 24, verse 41, the last time in his gospel, that is. And it is after Jesus' resurrection, and he appears to the disciples in that room, and they marveled. They just, they can't, they can't take it in. They're just overwhelmed. They're, they're, they're so, um, uh, uh, and their, the whole demeanor changes as a, as a result from being locked in an upper room and morbid and sad to being filled with joy and thanksgiving. I'm reminded of the words of Psalm 118, speaking of another event uh, of in connection with Jesus. And verse 23, it says, This was the doing of the Lord. It is marvelous in our eyes. Brethren, that's how we're to respond to the incarnation. That's the true observance and celebration of the incarnation. When we are able to say, this was the doing of the Lord God, and it is marvelous. It's wondrous in our eyes. I'm full of gratitude and joy and thanksgiving because of what his incarnation has done for me, what he has done for me in his life and death and resurrection, taking my sin giving me salvation and faith and obedience and love uh, and service, all those things that are the outflow of salvation and the evidence of salvation. And brethren, the incarnation is more marvelous than the internal combustion engine. It's more marvelous than man going to the moon or to Mars. The incarnation is more marvelous than the digital age that has made the world um, a much smaller place, like a global village. Um, the incarnation is more marvelous than developments in science and technology and medicine. One event stands apart from and above every other event in history. The incarnation. Of the Son of God to reveal godliness and to accomplish godliness in us and for us and through us. And this is how we are to relate to the incarnation. Our hearts are to be filled with joy, our tongues with melody. It's not the cheap reverberating music that we hear around the shops and the streets during the month of December. But with the glory and praise that befit the incarnation. The more glorious an event is, the more um, build up there is of the praise. Is that not correct? There wasn't much fanfare about um, Heather's marriage to me. I wasn't anybody very important. But when um, William 
married Kate, there was a huge fanfare, wasn't there? Because someone important. Well, the most important person, the most important thing that could happen for sinners like us, the, the eternal God, the Son of God becoming man, deserves a fanfare. Not something that's trite and cheap and commercialized. And you see, brethren, this is what Scripture does. It lifts us, lifts us up, lifts our minds up. And this is what we see the angels expressing. Not making this up, that's what the angels expressed to the shepherds. The praise of one angel and then the multitude, glory to God in the highest. To be quite honest, the tinsel and the trees and the trappings won't achieve it. Won't achieve it. God's Spirit working in our hearts and taking God's truth and making it live to us, especially the truth, of course, being ultimately God's Christ, making him live to us. That's the joy. And that's what does it. And the commercialism that marks the season robs the incarnation, I want to suggest, of its inestimable value. Robs it. And makes many hearts, sadly, the thorny ground of Jesus' parable. The nativity scene that appears in churches and town centres and on cards and is acted out endlessly in a gra is a graven image. It's a graven image. It's a travesty of the inexpressible glory of the incarnate Son, of the Christ man. And the indulgence of the West conveniently ignores the poverty that marked the incarnation and the life of the Son of God on earth. And as we saw in our call to worship, why it was he became poor. 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. How sad it is that in all the focus and all the razzmatazz of this time of year, there's no call to people become rich in Christ through the incarnate Christ. Um, because in him is the grace of God unto salvation. And so, brothers and sisters in Christ, we've revisited Christmas, and in the light of that, let us shift our focus. Let us shift our focus. Away from what is observed by the contemporary church and within modern society, for it is a caricature of what happened in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago. And let's shift our focus and keep our focus on the incarnation as presented in Scripture. And let us affirm that incarnation in and through our lives and our witness that without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh. It's a miracle, it's a mystery, and it's a marvel. Let it be so to all of us. Amen.